so thanks to the chair and thanks for, to the organizers as well. Um, so I'll just say a couple of things before I go, go into the talk. So firstly, um, I'm coming from a background of virtue epistemology. So the philosophy of education for me is something of a new departure. So um, after the talk, if, if you think there's anything, any helpful direction I might take, I'd be very glad to hear your suggestions. Um, and then the other thing to say is that the talk is quite, it's quite modest in what it's trying to achieve. So really I'm just going to look at a basis for taking a particular stance on what the epistemic aim of education should be. Uh, so it's not, it's not necessary, it's not going to be an all things considered stance, it's not going to be the end of the story. Uh, with regard to what the epistemic aim of education should be, uh, but it's going to be looking at a particular argument that will give a basis for the support of one position. Okay, so this is the structure of the talk. So I'm going to start by talking about epistemic value and philosophy of education, so how the two are linked together and how what I say about epistemic value will feed into uh, philosophy of education, in particular with regard to what the epistemic aims of education should be. And then I'll talk about the value of knowledge. And of course, there's a, there's a whole literature on the value of knowledge now. And I'll start from the standard uh, point of departure, which tends to be looking at the Mino, uh, the dialogue by Plato. Um, and that, that's questioning why is knowledge more viable than true belief. And then I'll look at Greco's account, um, which seems to give us a solution to various value problems and in turn has uh, implications for uh, what the epistemic aim of education should be. And then finally, I'll look at an objection to Greco's argument and I'll say what in turn that has uh, to say to what the epistemic aims of education should be. Okay, so as I've said, the concern of my paper is the epistemic uh, aim of education. So I draw on the discourse on the value of epistemic goods in order to inform position on what the epistemic aim of education should be. So just to be very clear, by epistemic goods, I mean things like true belief, uh, justified belief, uh, ju justified true belief, and knowledge. Um, so there are other epistemic goods that I actually won't be talking about. Uh, so understanding is one, and wisdom is plausibly one as well. Okay, so my research is drawing on, uh, drawing on research in epistemology to inform a position in philosophy of education and falls on from Siegel, who discusses this, this move from talking about the value of epistemic goods to moving to, to uh, what the epistemic aim of education should be. And Pritchard, who sets out his own account um, on what the epistemic aim of education should be. So I argue that there's a theoretical basis from the value of epistemic goods discourse for an education that aims to promote virtuous belief as well as knowledge. So this is the position I'm going, I'm going to be defending, that there is a theoretical basis uh, from this discourse, and we'll talk about the discourse, that supports the position um, that uh, an education that aims, we should have an education that aims uh, to promote virtuous belief as well as knowledge. So not just knowledge, virtuous belief as well. Okay, so now I'm moving to the discourse on um, the value of epistemic goods. So I mentioned uh, one of the value problems as Pritchard identifies, as, uh, as Pritchard identifies it, which is why is knowledge more valuable than true belief? And that's supposed to correspond to an intuition. That's, we're supposed to have this intuition that, yeah, knowledge is more valuable than true belief. We might have difficulty articulating why, and that's one of the projects, trying to say why knowledge is more valuable. But a starting point is that we're supposed to have this intuition. Similarly, we're supposed to have intuitions for the other 
value problems that Richard identifies corresponding intuitions. So the second value problem is why is knowledge more valuable than that which falls short of knowledge? So why is knowledge more valuable, say, than justified true belief uh, that's been gettiered or basically that doesn't amount to knowledge? So again, we're supposed to have the intuition that knowledge is more valuable than mere justified true belief that's not knowledge. And finally, there's also Pritchard claims, he's received some criticism for this, there's also an intuition that knowledge is not just on a continuum more valuable than um, justified true belief or that which falls short of knowledge. It's also differently valuable or distinct, uh, distinctly valuable. So it's not as if um, you go from having a true belief to having a justified belief to having knowledge, and knowledge is just a little bit more valuable than, say, justified true belief that isn't knowledge. Uh, so Pritchard claims that there's also um, a value problem that can be articulated as why is knowledge distinct, distinctively valuable vis-a-vis -vis that which falls short of knowledge? Okay, so here's the Mino, here's the standard starting place. So Socrates asks Mino uh, what difference there would be between knowing the way to Larissa and having a true belief about the way. What difference would it make? And Mino answers that, uh, well, as long as the true belief remained, then they seem equally as good, right? So um, one person has a true belief about how to get to this place called Larissa, the other person has knowledge. Well, if the true belief stays in place, then there doesn't seem to be any difference. They seem to be just as good as each other. But of course, this leads to uh, the question, well, why is knowledge more prized? Why, why do we think knowledge is more viable? So Socrates claims that superiority of knowledge lies in its keeping a true belief in place. Uh, so uh, Socrates says that in, in Plato's dialogue, uh, that knowledge does this by tying true belief down with explanatory reasoning. So the idea is that if you only have a true belief, it's liable to get away. It's going to be, you, it's going to be easily lost. Whereas if you have knowledge, you have something tying down that knowledge. Uh, if you have knowledge, you have something tying down that true belief, which is explanatory reasons. You're not going to give up your true belief easily. You have explanatory reasons for your belief that is true. Uh, so if you know the way to Larissa, then you will go the correct way. If, on the other hand, you merely have a true belief, then that true belief may easily be lost. This may happen if you encounter evidence that suggests that your belief is mistaken. So if you only have a true belief, you encounter evidence that suggests your belief is mistaken, um, then you don't have knowledge, you don't have explanatory reasoning tying down this uh, true belief, uh, you're liable to give up that belief. Okay, so there are a number of problems with this account of why knowledge is more viable than true belief. Uh, so I'm only going to look at one particular um, reason or basis for, for not wanting to go along with this. Um, so this is, this is the point. So yet stably held true beliefs are not exclusively true beliefs that are known. A true belief could, perhaps because of sheer dogmatism or maybe indoctrination, be stably held without, without us knowing that true belief, uh, without us taking that true belief to be knowledge. So we can imagine someone, uh, so the example is that a member of a cult is brainwashed and it just so happens that one of the beliefs that they're brainwashed, one of the propositions they're brainwashed to believe is true, um, then if the brainwashing works as brainwashing is supposed to work, um, then they'll stick to this belief. They won't give up this belief easily. This belief will be tied down. And if it's true, then it looks just as good as uh, knowledge Right, So this will be a case where you have a true belief uh, that's tied down, that you're not easily going to lose. And this looks like a real problem, 
because this doesn't satisfy our intuition, so we still have the intuition that knowledge is better than this. We don't want to say that they're just as viable. Okay, so here's a different approach to the question of the value of knowledge. Um, but to get to this account of the value of knowledge, first I have to say a little bit about uh, the account of the nature of knowledge, or basically the definition of knowledge, so how Greco uh, defines knowledge. So S knows that P, if and only if S believes truly because of, S, because of S's reliable cognitive abilities. So S is believing the truth that 28 multiplied by 9 is 252 is explained by S's believing from ability. A belief, uh, sorry, a benefit of the account is that uh, no separate condition is needed for dealing with standard Gettier cases. Okay, so this, this idea is that um, look, if somebody knows, then it's, it is, it's the case that they have a belief that's true because of the exercise of their ability. Um, and this, uh, this, is a, this is quite a popular, well, it's uh, quite an influential approach in the literature. So uh, Greco has one version of this. Um, Sosa has another version of this. Um, so there, there are a few people who are pushing this line. So it gets called robust virtue epistemology. And so centrally important is the causal relation, right? So the, person, the person's belief is true because of the exercise of durability, where the because is explanatory, right? So why is the person's belief true? Um, well, because they exercise durability. What explains their belief being true? The exercise of durability. Right, so then you have the example. So... S is believing the truth that 28 multiplied by 9 is 252. Well, why does he believe that truth? Well, because of his ability. So Greco argues that knowledge is viable in a way that mere true belief is not because it is a cognitive success that is creditable to the agent, while mere true belief is not. Knowledge is creditable in that it's a success that is the result of one's abilities. So when you just have a true belief, you have a belief that happens to be true, that's not knowledge, um, it's not going to be creditable to you. Whereas when you have knowledge, you have something that gets termed cognitive success. Uh, the cognitive success is that you have a true belief, and you have a true belief because of your abilities. And so you deserve credit for getting the true belief. It's because of you. It's because of your abilities or the ability, at least, uh, the abilities of the cognitive agents. Um, just some, uh, a quick uh, clarificatory point is that abilities are conceived as being reliable. So uh, this particular form of virtue epistemology gets called virtue reliabilism. So uh, the ability is something that's grounded in the agent. It's not something outside of the agent. That's why we can say that the agent gets credit uh, for having a belief that's true when that belief is true because of their abilities. Okay, so Greco characterized cognitive success from ability as being a cognitive achievement. So this is, this is moving towards the value claim that's made. So, uh, so, uh, so anything, so the definition of an achievement is just when someone has a success from ability, basically. And Greco referencing Aristotle holds that achievements are constitutive of human flourishing. He characterizes the kind of value that knowledge has as a cognitive achievement, as that of intrinsic value. Uh, so Pritchard argues, and actually Greco later on goes along with this, um, that really we should think of this as final value rather than intrinsic value. Um, so final value is just that something is valuable for its own sake and it can be valuable for its own sake um, because of relational properties. So an example given is the first book of the first printing press. 
it's valuable for its own sake in this case because of relational properties but this isn't a this isn't a major concern of what I want to say today and um, so if you if it's easier to think of intrinsic value I think I think that will work and um, but the important point to make is that Greco has now given us this definition of an achievement success from ability and what is knowledge well it's exactly that it's a cognitive success because of cognitive abilities knowledge is a kind of achievement achievements are uh, constitutive of the good life and finally finally viable and he's appealing to Aristotle on this okay and so Pritchard uh, sets out the argument as follows um, so the first premise is achievements are successes that are because of ability that's the achievement thesis the second premise is that knowledge is a cognitive success that is because of cognitive ability and, it's, and then the conclusion from that is that knowledge is a cognitive achievement next premise achievements are finally viable and then the conclusion is that knowledge is finally viable or has final value Okay, so then the, what's important about this argument is that this looks like not only a solution to the Mino problem, to the first value problem, of why is knowledge more valuable than true belief, it's also a solution to the other value problems, or it seems to be a solution to the other value problems that Pritchard identifies. Why is, it, why is knowledge more valuable than true belief on this account? Uh, well, knowledge is an achievement. True belief, mere true belief isn't an achievement. Um, you don't get any credit for just having, a mere, just having a true belief. So we get an answer to that. And it also seems to be an answer to why knowledge is not just more viable than that which falls short of knowledge, but also why knowledge is distinctively viable. So a justified true belief might be, uh, it might, might have practical value, uh, might be on the same spectrum with knowledge in terms of practical value, but knowledge has this other kind of value that justified true belief doesn't have in virtue of knowledge being an achievement, whereas justified true belief on this account isn't an achievement. So what are the educational implications? So it is, of course, plausible that the attainment of epistemic goods is among the appropriate aims of an education. If Greco's view is right, then we have a basis for favoring the promotion of the achievement of knowledge ahead of other epistemic goods. Right? So, of course, there's, like I said at the beginning, there's more to be said, but in terms of what epistemic uh, standing or epistemic good should be promoted in education, um, this gives us a basis for saying, well, look, we shouldn't, we shouldn't aim for just promoting true belief. We should aim for promoting knowledge. Um, and the basis for saying that is because knowledge is a kind of achievement, so on the part of the knower, and an achievement is constitutive of the good life. It's constitutive of human flourishing, and it has a special value. It's finally viable or intrinsically viable. Okay, so the basis we have for promoting knowledge ahead of the other epistemic goods is that knowledge is an achievement, while other epistemic uh, goods which fall short of knowledge are not achievements. If we have a choice, true education between promoting the attainment of epistemic goods that are constitutive of the good life, as knowledge as an achievement is on Greco's account, and epistemic goods that are not, then we have a basis for promoting the attainment of such epistemic goods. Greco's account can say why knowledge is more viable than true belief. After all, mere true belief can't plausibly be thought of as any kind of achievement creditable to the cognitive abilities of the believer. But on closer inspection, does Greco's account really help with justified belief? Newtonian physics, as a worldview, strictly speaking, is false. Yet it would be very counterintuitive to maintain that Newtonian, uh, Newton's physics doesn't represent a cognitive achievement and hence is therefore not also finally viable. That's if we, of course, if we accept the achievement thesis that achievements are constituted a good life and are finally viable. 
Here's another example, a police investigator who sifts through a large quantity of a variety of evidence and forms a belief in accordance with the evidence, plausibly has a justified belief, and plausibly that belief is a cognitive achievement. So it might be maintained that there's no cognitive achievement without knowledge being reached. So a belief that is not true but is held because of, co because of the cognitive abilities of the believer doesn't have the status of an achievement. So this might be the response. An agent reaching a belief because of his or her reliable cognitive abilities and so we can call them justified but doesn't know, hasn't achieved anything. Right, so the idea might be, well, justified belief is only worth something um, if it gets you uh, a, the, the, what it aims at, so if it gets you truth. And if you just have a justified uh, belief without it getting you uh, its appropriate aim, if, without it getting you truth, um, then it shouldn't be thought of as being, uh, it shouldn't be thought of as an achievement. It's, it's, it's failed in, in uh, what its, its function is, you might look at it like that. So in this view, having a justified belief is not a discrete achievement, but rather is only uh, a part of the achievement that knowledge constitutes. So a footballer who takes a good shot, but who doesn't score, hasn't achieved anything. That might be the response to what I've said. But notice that to keep the example analogous to what's going on when there is a justified belief and not merely a belief, we have to talk about a good shot. In what sense is taking a good shot not an achievement? It's good rather than bad or turning out to be lucky because of the footballing ability of the player. So here's the objection stated in more, a more formal form. So premise one is the same, achievements are successes that are because of ability. Premise two, justified belief is a cognitive success that is because of cognitive ability. Conclusion, so justified belief is a cognitive achievement. Premise three, achievements are finally valuable. Uh, conclusion two, so justified belief has final value. Premise four, knowledge has final value. Uh, conclusion three, knowledge and justified belief have the same kind of value. So then we lose uh, Greco's account as solving uh, the tree value problems. We, we're not going to be able to say that uh, Greco gives us an account that shows why knowledge is distinctively valuable vis-a-vis -vis that which falls short of knowledge. So I'm, I'm using the case of justified belief, but of course the same applies to justified true belief. Um, okay, so then the other point, of course, to make is that if our basis for promoting knowledge ahead of other epistemic goods is that it's an achievement and achievements are constitutive of the good life, um, then sort of by rules of parity, we should say the same about justified belief. So if justified belief is also an achievement, then we no longer have a basis for saying that uh, knowledge is more worthy of promotion over justified belief, at least within the, within the context of, of this discussion. So Greco's argument depends on achievements being finally valuable and no epistemic good that falls short of knowledge being an achievement. I've argued that justified belief is plausibly also an achievement. Based on the argument so far, therefore, we, have, uh, we should reject the, uh, reject the attainment of knowledge over justified belief as an educational aim. In fact, if we accept other aspects of the argument, the result is that justified belief and knowledge with respect to their statuses as achievements are equally worthy of promotion. Okay, so um, Pritchard argues against the claim that achievements simpliciter are finally viable. So he does so by first distinguishing between different grades of cognitive achievement. So strong cognitive achievement uh, cognitive achievement proper and weak cognitive achievement. He then argues for treating strong cognitive achievements as finally viable. 
So the thought is quite intuitive, I think. So the thought is that um, think back to what we were discussing earlier. We were talking about cases of knowledge. And when it comes to knowledge, we can have knowledge like the police investigator has that involves um, forming a belief after sifting through lots of evidence and then forming a belief in accordance with the evidence. Uh, but of course, we can also have perceptual knowledge. So we can have knowledge just by, in normal circumstances, just by opening up our eyes and looking around and forming beliefs about what's in front of us. So Pritchard's thought is that we shouldn't want to say that achievements like that uh, should be thought of as finally viable. So given that there's... Uh, okay, so that's Pr Pritchard's position. So here's, here's a response to what Pritchard says. So given that there's not any difference in kind between weak and strong achievements as they are both achievements, it looks more plausible to say that the sorts of achievements that fall in at the weaker end of the achievement spectrum should still be considered finally valuable, albeit weaker in final value. Uh, so there's no difference in kind um, between the weak, uh, form of the weak grade of achievement and the strong grade of achievement. There's still achievements. Um, so it would look odd to say that when we understand that there's going to be, uh, there's going to, there, there are going to be achievements that fall right across the spectrum, it would look odd to say that we should only count strong achievements as being finally viable. Uh, so the thought is that, well, we can still say that, we can still make, uh, we can still discriminate somewhat between strong achievements and weak achievements. We can say that some are more finally viable than others. So that's the line I'm taking. Okay, so in conclusion, of course we want uh, those being educated to learn about the world and so have particular true beliefs. We also want those being educated to learn to form beliefs about such matters in the right way. So if a person is educated such that she is able to form virtuous beliefs or justified beliefs, then her doing so is itself an achievement and as such is possibly valuable for its own sake. Thank you. have again 10 or a little bit more than 10 minutes of time for questions. Well, the first one. Thanks, Shane. Uh, I, I have a more fundamental problem with Greco's account. Okay. Uh, cognitive ability. So you started with saying that if uh, someone has justified true belief, but let's say they've been, it's a cult that's been brainwashed into believing uh, uh, X, yeah. then that doesn't really count as knowledge. Yeah. I'm wondering why the same doesn't apply to the process, uh, the cognitive ability, uh, the culmination of which counts as knowledge on Greco's account. So if a cult is uh, put through a process inculcated with an ability which is geared towards only certain kinds of uh, truths, which like X are problematic, or maybe even true, but it's been sort of uh, geared towards uh, coming at certain truths, why does the successful culmination of that ability count as knowledge? Okay, good. Um, right, so Greco understands ability as a truth conducive process that's grounded in the cognitive agent. So his position is also sometimes called agent reliabilism, virtue reliabilism, um, and it's distinguished from simple process reliabilism. Um, so simple process reliabilism s says, well, it doesn't say anything about the need for the reliable process to be granted in the agent. It's perfectly fine for the reliability to come from an outside source. It's just, you know, your belief has to be formed on the basis of this reliable process. Um, so I, I'm kind of taking it that that's what, what your question is getting at. Well, what's wrong with that view? Um, so there are a few examples given in the literature against... Uh, thinking that, okay, so there's some, some cases in literature where the, there is a simple process reliabilism, a person is believing according to reliable process, but that process isn't grounded in the age, it's not part of cognitive character. So the examples are 
There's one called the brain lesion case. There's another one called the careless math student case. So they're kind of, they're both a bit weird, uh, but here they are anyway. Um, I'll give you one anyway. So brain lesion case is uh, someone forms a brain lesion, right? So it, it just happens to them um, that a lesion forms on their brain. And an effect of the lesion forming on the brain is that it gives them, uh, it gives the agent a belief that they have a brain lesion. And the thought is that there's something... It's it's reliable. It's reliable, right? So it's uh, it's promoting the uh, true beliefs um, reliably. So it's giving the right kind of beliefs. But the problem is that it's it seems like so. Firstly, intuitively, um, it doesn't seem like a case of knowledge. And then the virtue uh, reliablest answer is that the, the the problem is that this isn't a reliable process that's grounded in the agent. It's something that's sort of happening to the agent, but uh, when it's not a process that's part of the agent's cognitive character, um, then it's not going to be a case of knowledge. We need so another way of putting this is that um, knowledge is something that should should correspond or should should uh, fit with an ability intuition, right? So there is this intuition that when someone has knowledge, um, then it's the agent is contributing something. It's not just something that's happened to the agent. Judith? Judith? Uh, thank you. I, I'd like you to say a bit more about uh, how you're framing this in terms of educational aims, because yeah. there seemed to be some slippage at the beginning as, as to whether you're talking about this account as, as grounding um, a particular virtuous epistemology as an aim of education or as the aim of education. And the problem that I have with the latter is that your account is entirely based upon knowledge as propositional knowledge. But I wonder what, what space there is in this account of aims of education for other forms of knowledge, for knowledge by acquaintance, for forms of practical knowledge, knowing how. Yeah. What does that do to your sort of framing of this as an educational aim? Yeah, so uh, like I said at the beginning, I think what I'm doing is kind of modest. So I'm looking at... Uh, a basis for taking a stand on what what epistemic aims there should be in education. And I'm not saying it's the final story, but I think it'll be part of the final story. But of course you're right. Um, so I think we had, a, we had a question in the, in the previous discussion about art. Um, and, you know, art seems like, or music seems, they both seem like things that are uh, worth learning as part of an education. And their case, they seem to be cases that are best thought of as know-how cases. Uh, maybe, maybe there's another description, but they don't, they don't fall into propositional knowledge. So I'm happy to say that um, this isn't going to give you a, a final answer to what the epistemic aims of education should be, but it'll give you uh, a basis for saying, well, uh, knowledge and virtuous belief um, there's, there is a basis for thinking that they should be um, included. <laughs> First to the back, to the cafe, perhaps. <laughs> then this side. Okay, okay looking at uh, the characterization you gave, I'd like to say that knowledge is not, in fact, an achievement. Justified belief is an achievement, but insofar as knowledge goes beyond that, that is to say it's lucky that it's not Gettiard, that's beyond anybody's abilities. So in fact, if we're going to go for this achievement account, we should say that justified belief is where it stops. Yeah, okay. Um so this is tricky for me to answer because I'm, I'm quite sympathetic to what you've just said. So actually, this is part, a lot of this comes from my PhD thesis. And in my PhD thesis, I also argue for what I call epistemic race. Uh, so the thought is that um, what we can do is basically form virtuous beliefs and then one way of a more traditional way of putting it is then 
the world either cooperates or it doesn't. Or the way I've put it is that uh, either our belief enjoys epistemic grace or it doesn't. I think at least by putting it like this, so obviously knowledge is going to include uh, virtuous belief, and at least by putting it like this, I can be neutral on whether the later thing I say is actually right or not. So if you, if you don't buy into the later position, uh, you, you, you do seem to buy into it, I'm, I'm glad about that, but if you don't buy into the later position, um, then saying that it's knowledge and just, justified belief um, makes sense, right? You don't have to sign up to my, my later position. But of course, if you do sign up to my later position, then knowledge will be included by default because it'll include justified belief. Knowledge would be no more valuable than justified belief. Yeah, I agree. So, so therefore, Newton is in there. Yeah, I agree. Okay. We shall take some questions from the other side. Uh, so playing off your uh, idea of epistemic grace, which I guess is Fogelin-esque in some sense. It's what? Fogelin, like Robert Fogelin talks about something similar. Um, uh, you said at the outset that you're not going to talk about epistemic standings other than the ones that you did talk about. Yeah. Now, I'm going to talk about something that's probably not even an epistemic standing, something like doubt. Like from the point of view of education, particularly in a philosophy classroom, yeah. sometimes it's just desirable to have the students in a state of suspended animation where they cannot make up their minds between two difficult positions, yeah. right? So uh, I was wondering if you could just theorize on your feet about, as a, as a virtual reliabilist, uh, about doubt. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so, so firstly, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm purely a virtual reliabilist. I actually think in, uh, it's maybe getting into other territory, but to deal with uh, certainly some kinds of testimonial knowledge, you virtue reliabilism doesn't work very well and you need um, uh, virtue responsibilism. Um, when it comes to doubt, yeah, so doubt is one way of putting it, but I know there are other people working on the value of questions, um, so the value of asking questions. Um, so, I, you know, it's, it's hard to go beyond saying I, I, can see, um, I can see that it would have a value. I don't know how to how to theorize it, how to, how to place its value. Um, I, it obviously can have an instrumental value. I don't know if we, can, if we can say that there's a basis for saying it has intrinsic or final value. Then another, then another, um, another point that's similar is to push the line that we should also be interested in um, intellectual character traits. So we should also be concerned with um, in, uh, promoting um, intellectual cur courage, um, int intellectual thoroughness, open-mindedness. Um, these are character traits that should also be promoted. But these uh, standard position is that these, these are traits that aren't necessarily true conducive. So um, you could have these traits and be in a really bad epistemic environment. Um, this is something uh, Jason Baer, for example, promotes, that we should, we should encourage these uh, character traits. And interestingly, he's the founder of a school as well, and he's putting this into practice. One more, one more question from that side. There are no more questions, but one question from Rebecca, and then you... Yeah, uh, uh, my question was basically like, are you uh, seem to also working with a theory of epistemic responsibility when you're talking about like, you know, knowledge is about, uh, you mentioned somewhere uh, that you achieve true belief because of your abilities. So basically, so there is, there seems to be a conscious engagement there. So it, it seems that you are working with a theory of epistemic responsibility, which you don't spell out, or which you don't even mention responsibility completely. In your, and I was like a, a bit surprised that you actually don't do so. And when you actually do that, then 
when we talk about education it seems that uh, then it could just be an aim but like how would uh, we constitute education if it is just only about our own way of dealing with our abilities or creating those kind of virtues you know so it could just be an educational aim but do you actually see it uh, because it's also an engagement in in a much more different sphere right when we talk about educational spheres so yeah so two questions basically are you working with a theory of epistemic responsibility which you don't spell out or what would that uh, spell out mean and what would this mean in terms of educational achieve not achievements like engagements more more so not only aims but also engagements thank you okay so when it comes to responsibility um really for the argument here i'm i'm going with greco a lot of the way and so virtue reliableness they they're thinking of uh, abilities as being things like um excellent eyesight uh good memory um uh re reasoning power uh, so these are these are different sources so firstly there are different sources that we can have for knowledge and the claim by virtue reliableists is that uh, they're also truth conducive um processes and they're processes that are grounded in the cognitive character of epistemic agents so responsibility it doesn't really play so much of a role uh, in that discussion and um, when it comes to engagements um so are you is the is the question something like how would so we we have this position we have this argument that's been made that uh, virtuous belief and knowledge should be promoted or there's a basis for them to be promoted and then is the question something like what will it look like if we promote promote these or you know how how would we do this or <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, uh, two less. Okay, maybe two we can talk about it later. Two less questions first, you and less question then Claudia. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, two questions. One, uh, I find there is a missing link. You know, when you are equating at a certain stage after arguments, true belief and knowledge. Yeah. Um, you are not talking about the process through which the true belief has been reached and knowledge has been reached. Uh, when you are talking about true belief, then you are immediately saying it is an, a, it's a cognitive achievement. Has the true belief come through a cognitive process? Right? Mm -hmm. A process that, that's acceptable. If it's not then the, you cannot equate. Then it cannot be called cognitive achievement. So unless you clearly talk about the process through which the belief has been reached, and belief only happens to be true, it could happen to be false, mm -hmm. right? So there is a basic difference between belief and knowledge, yeah. right? And in a way uh, that because it is true, uh, the process of reaching has been ignored. And in my view, if you go about the process, then you will never be able to say that the true are the same. You'll never be able to say what? You'll yeah. never be able to say that true belief is equal to knowledge. Cognitively, it's not a cognitive achievement because it does not follow the kind of cognitive process uh, that arriving at or constructing knowledge follows. Okay. Whatever be your response. Second point. When you're talking about belief, where is the difference between belief and values? Right? I'll, I'll take you. I was involved in gender sensitivity trainings. Right? And t with teachers. And I found teachers gradually uh, not accepting the equality of men and women. Right? And giving all kinds of arguments. Ultimately, I said, all right, that is what you believe. 
I am giving arguments, counter arguments. That is what you believe, right? The matter has ended there. Uh, and of course, there were processes tried to change their belief. But the question I am raising is, is this a belief? Or is it a value? Okay, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I hope there's, there, there wasn't a misunderstanding, but um, the position is that a mere true belief is very different from knowledge. So on Greco's account, of course, someone can happen to have a belief that is true, um, but that does, you know, that's, that's not knowledge if it just happens to, to be true. Um, so what makes, true belief is a requirement for knowledge. It's necessary for knowledge, but it's not sufficient for knowledge. So what, um, how do we get from true belief to knowledge or what explains, or what is the difference between true belief and knowledge? So for Greco, the difference is that true belief has to be present. So you have to believe truly, but you're also, it also is a requirement that you believe, or the total requirement is that you believe truly because of ability. That's knowledge. True belief by itself isn't supposed to be knowledge. Okay, better last question, Claudio. Can you pass the micro to Claudia? Uh, sorry, oh. there was a second. Oh, I'm well. sorry, I'm sorry yeah. about that. Uh, so the value belief um, question. Yeah, I, so... So we'd expect uh, values to inform beliefs and probably beliefs to inform values. Um, I'm not sure... I don't think it's very easy to entangle the, untangle the two. Um, you could try to give a definition of belief, maybe something like a, a endorse, endorsing a particular proposition as being the case or something like that. But um, I think it is, it's going to be tricky to untangle the two. So um, Pritchard does some work on belief in God. And um, the claim is that when it comes to certain beliefs, um, um, religious beliefs can be some of these beliefs, uh, certain beliefs may not be, uh, so certain uh, propositional attitudes may not be um, sensitive to evidence. And one position is to say that um, things like beliefs in God, where they don't seem to be sensitive or you know, different evidence, uh, this is the claim, uh, doesn't seem to make a difference to the belief um, or what gets called the belief, then maybe we should think it's just a different kind of thing than uh, our standard beliefs or what we standardly call beliefs. Um, so that's the best I can say about the second point. Now, last question, Claudia. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I had actually two or three comments, but I'll just uh, be very brief. It seems to me that if you want to have an account of the epistemic of epistemic value in the context of education, uh, then it doesn't seem to me that you know the right thing would be to look at it in terms of cognitive achievement because that uh, sort of leads to what quickly uh, because it, it's not a matter of when we tie down knowledge or true belief with justification reasons. It's not that it doesn't ever change but that you can relate it to you believe that and you also believe know the reasons why you believe that. And so it's not why one doesn't have to assume some kind of an infallibilism. I mean, knowledge could, that's one comment. The other one is that <clears throat> uh, this, uh, another uh, important point that uh, Socrates, I mean, in the Socratic dialogues, knowledge is not it, it's meant to guide action, decision making. It's meant so. Its effects, I think, are very important. That's one thing. The other thing, I don't know if it appears in Mino or Latches, the dialogue that the, one of the criterion that Socrates advances for knowledge is teachability. He says that many of these people who know about courage, who act courageously, don't pass it on to their they children. Say they don't. They don't pass it on to their children or to yes. those they love because they don't know it truly because they cannot teach it. So teachability seems to be another in interesting thing which is important in the context of education and I don't know if people have looked at that epistemic value. Yeah, so actually uh, 
whether it's possible to teach the virtues comes up in the Mino. And there's, there's a kind of, from what I remember, there's this kind of skepticism that the virtues can be taught. And there are precisely those kind of examples given of parents who seem to have the virtues, but the children don't seem to have the virtues. Um, then on the, the first point, um, so there seem to be uh, different, different issues there. So um, one was that when you, if we, if we go along with the Socratic conception of knowledge, then an advantage of the Socratic conception of knowledge, and this might tie in with another question, is that you're responsible for your belief in some kind of sense. You have your explanatory reasons. Um, and so this would fit with a kind of internalism about knowledge. Um, so you could say that it has this, this kind of advantage. I mean, the question, of course, is that, well, is, is this a requirement for knowledge? So it might have this sort of positive ethical advantage, but is it a requirement for knowledge that um, you do have to be able to point to the basis for your belief in order to have knowledge? That seemed to be what you're, you were suggesting. Um, and then, yes, can you remind me of the second, the second point? Te teachability, was that the second or third point? The second point was that uh, to, it doesn't have to be fixed. I mean, your argument was that if, uh, you know, like indoctrination or, yeah. uh, w you know, where the belief doesn't change. Yeah. And so uh, the value of tying something down is not to fix it, but to know the reasons why. And yeah. that's different from fixing it because it, mi it might, for instance, change. It might be... Followed. Right. Yeah. So uh, I only mentioned one of the objections to the Socratic account, which was that we end up getting the results that um, that true belief uh, that's arrived at true indoctrination and is uh, stably held, it looks like it has the same value as true belief that's tied down with explanatory reasons. So, yeah, I think you're right that we could say that, well, there's this advantage that the Socratic account has over this indoctrination account that um, person can point to the reasons why they believe what they believe. I mean, you know, you can come up with, you could think of cases in the indoctrination case where they might be given something to appeal to too. So I guess it's, it's, a, it's a bit tricky, but there's, there are other reasons for worrying about the Socratic account. So the, another thing to say about the Socratic account, and you suggested this yourself, um, that we're not typically now we're not infallible about knowledge right so um even when someone knows something they could still lose their true belief so i could know the way to larissa uh, but then i meet um you know someone who i you know someone who i regard as an authority about getting to larissa on the road and out of mischief they tell me to tell me the road has been closed you can't go that way anymore you have to take this other way and so there are cases where I could lose knowledge as well, even if I have a justified belief.